worked any miracles in anyone's life in here. Amen. 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 And you know he's a promise keeper. Yes. Amen. Oh, you can clap for that one too. Yes. Amen. Because how many of you realize in here he can't be a way maker and not be a promise keeper? Because he's a promise keeper, he's a way maker. Amen. How you have found him to be a light in the darkness. Amen. When we sang this down in the park after we went out of that song, we said, because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will open up my mouth. Amen. Amen. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Amen. Amen. We stand in the midst of his holiness this morning. And we give him praise and honor and glory in this place. If you'll bow your heads <clears throat> with me. Dear God, we thank you. And we give you glory and honor one more time. While we stand in this place, Lord, to worship you and we thank you so much for our youth who have come today and have rendered beautiful service and singing and their prayers and Lord Mr. Trevon's prayer and, and uh, Jayla's offering God what she did and Joel and all of the singers the sign holders we we love that you just decide to use our youth God in such a powerful way the song leaders the the words of the song just grab me today, God. That is who you are. I'm reminded of what you spoke in your word that says, suffer the little children to come unto me for such, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom is likened to a child as we receive it in childlike faith. Lord, your kingdom is coming. No man can stop it. No program can stop it. No power on earth can stop it. You are coming, and Lord, every time I see our church sing and hear people minister and witness and, and praise God, I see your kingdom coming. So Lord, now bless even me to bear this message to those whom you have brought to this place today. Give me preaching power. Give me clarity in my mind and my heart. In voice, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Some quotes, and some of these hit home to me, changing the at atmosphere. School bells <clears throat> are ringing loud and clear. <laughs> Vacation is over, and school is here. Amen. The first day of school, someone said, is always a fashion show. <clears throat> it is one, someone said, a parent, it is one of my favorite seasons back to school. Amen. And then someone else said, <clears throat> Let us remember one book, one pen, one child, and one teacher can change the world. Amen. Today, we want to speak on changing the atmosphere in our schools. And uh, young people, this is for you. <clears throat> this is... Uh, for you specifically, however, adults, certainly you can get something from this message today. The background on this series we preached first week was changing the atmosphere personally. And then <clears throat> last week, changing the atmosphere on a family level. We all can say in here that we need to change the atmosphere, change the mood, change the spiritual timber of our area, of our world. It's down. It is hurting. Uh, 
you, I pray that you don't take lightly the opportunities that you have in this church to, to witness, to minister, to be witnessed to, to be ministered to. And I was not being funny at all when I said that Deacon Coach Piles shared in a mighty way <clears throat> this past Wednesday. And, and they came out there fired up. The adults were even fired up. Amen. That's what we need. I thank God for Minister Smith who stands on the wall and ministers to our youth. Minister Edward Griffin. Uh, and Lynette comes home all the time and said, I just love Minister Griffin. He, he just bears his heart and shares God's word. Uh, Brother JT a few weeks ago. Sister Cassie most often. Um, and we love them. We love our youth leaders. All of our younger teachers, Sister Pyle, Sister Scott, um, Sister Penny, we thank God for you and all those who support. I hope you don't take lightly the fact that we have some A-plus folks here that don't ask for a dime. Amen. And they pour in to our youth. Y'all praying with me this morning. They, they pour into our youth because they know what the world is like. Where they're, they're, they're headed into and, and the things that are happening around us even now. And I begin to think about my youth. I spent a lot of my youth days in this church and then quite a few at, at my home church. And I remember various ones like Brother Jim Williams who started groups and had us out raking leaves and, and doing youth projects and sat us down and explained God's word. I remember the BTU classes and, and, and old Tristone, the, the building over there, we would, before we had the addition in the back, we'd meet in the corner back there by that metal door where the drums are. And that was our little classroom area um, on, on Sunday evenings. But you know what, though we didn't have facilities sometimes, though we didn't have the maybe one or two youth, they still came. They still poured into, they still took time. I can still see my Sunday school teacher taking me down to another church, dressed me up like little David. I had the headband, I had the slingshot, and I even found a rock on the side of the road to, to put in that little slingshot. And even though I was the only one from my church, I represented and they, they built me up and, and worked with me. And that's what it takes. Because when our kids go out to school, they need to know that there's a savior who loves them, but they also need to know that there's a congregation that supports them and is praying for them. Amen, Amen church. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so this start of school, we stand on the threshold of a year, a new year, school year, and one that I've never seen before I can't believe this is year 25 for me. I know I don't look that old. Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody ought to say it a little bit louder. But it's looming. The, the atmosphere is so thick in ways you can cut it with a knife. The atmosphere of uncertainty and, and what will happen I realize some students are online. And I realize some are in the building. And I realize that parents have had a, a difficult decision of what to do. But I believe God's word will lead us today in, in learning how to even change our atmosphere uh, in our schoolhouse. Amen. For we not only need the Lord in the White House. Amen. We need him in the poorhouse. We need him in the outhouse. Amen. We need him in the schoolhouse. And we need him in, in our houses. Amen. So the word of God is always in order. Just pray with me for just a little while. Turn to Luke, the second chapter, verses starting at verse 41. If you have it. Young people, make sure you <clears throat> grab it, please. Luke chapter 2, okay. <clears throat> verse 41. And I'll be reading from the New International Version today. So just follow along. Verse 41 says, Every year his parents went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. 
<clears throat> when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. So it was customary for them to go to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. How many of you can say amen that sometimes it's easy to lose track of a child? Amen. And they will uh, not know that you won't know exactly where they have gone in the home or, or however. Amen. amen. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Amen. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And then Jesus has recorded first words he says in verse 49 why were you searching for me he asked didn't you know i had to be in my father's house i had to be about my father's business but they did not understand what he was saying and then don't overlook these last two verses then he went down to nazareth with them and, and was obedient to them but his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You may be seated in his presence. Prayer is the key for this school year. Prayer is the pivot point. If we will pray, I believe God has a plan and a way for us to get through all of this. The start of school, this COVID, it will pray. Jesus was not always 30 years old, going around with disciples and healing, <clears throat> but he was an infant at one point in time. The Bible says Mary had him and laid him in a manger and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. He was a teenager. He was an adolescent. And here we see him 12 years old. He went on to become a young adult. And I want you to know that sometimes we make Jesus out to be so much God we forget of his humanity. He was 12 years old. Amen. If we have a 12 year old in here, raise your hand. Anybody 11? <clears throat> All right. Stand up, brother. Okay, Vaughn. Amen. See this young man? 11 years old. So keep in mind, Jesus was around his age. Thank you, young man. Jesus was around his age when this particular story happens. Now, I realize that the Bible only speaks of Jesus in terms of his birth. And then here are his first words at age 12. And then after that, you don't really hear any more about him until he is 30 years old. So we have to take this particular passage of scripture and understand that when it says he went down to Nazareth with them and was subject to them and was obedient to them, that for the next 18 years of his life, even though he was a young adult, that he listened to what his parents had to say. Now, I could take a whole sermon on that right there. Parents, you missed your opportunity to say amen real loud. Amen. 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 To be subject to what your mother and father, your grandmother, grandfather, what your, what your various ones in your family are teaching you from the scripture. It's important. I was once a teenager, and as my mom used to say, I thought I had the world in a bottle and the stopper in my hand. That's old folks talk for saying, I thought I knew everything. I thought I had it all up here. And in reality, I didn't know a whole lot of anything. But I thought I knew it. 
And I needed to know and understand that there were adults that could still work with me and get past the fact that I felt like, and I wasn't the only one, felt like I knew everything. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise God for one more time, youth leaders Amen. that have patience, yes, yes. have patience, yes, yes. and still work with our kids with all their different personalities. Amen. 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 Jesus was not always 30. He wasn't always walking around these dusty towns with disciples and healing people and raising the dead and casting out demons. He was 12. And in this passage, we see some opportunity for what he says in, this, in his first recorded words of how we can impact our schools for Christ. Christ was different, and so should we be. In fact, 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen race. You are a chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So in, in reading that verse of what Peter said, Peter who sat under Jesus' teaching, he is saying here, you cannot be young people, you cannot be old people, a chameleon Christian. Amen. What is a chameleon Christian? A chameleon Christian is one that blends in with the background. Mm -hmm. One that blends in with everything else you see. I had an anole in my classroom a long time ago, and that anole had the ability to blend in with his surroundings. If he was on a limb of the, of the tree that was brown, he would turn brown color. But if he was near the leaves, he would turn green. And there are some Christians today that no matter what the atmosphere is around them, maybe they're around a certain group of people. And when I say Christians, I use that with the ditto marks on each side, and they kind of turn to however the situation is. Amen. They're going to kick me up out of here, but I'm going to say it anyhow. The Lord is not looking for chameleon Christians, young people. So you're not going to blend in with all those who are around you. There'll be times you will look and sound and act different because of Christ Amen. in your life. And I thought about this because this message hits me before you ever hear it. I wondered in my time in high school, did I blend in or did I stand out for all the right reasons, amen? In America, our schools have become drug zones, war zones, sex zones, anti-Christ zones. If you don't believe it, watch these guys, these street preachers that go around and interview our youth and our young people and the stuff that comes out of their mouth is absolutely amazing. And don't think for a minute that's not in school. My advice to you today is to master the master. To be like Jesus, to live like him, to walk like him. And as we said a few weeks ago, we must practice young people putting Christ over the culture. The culture that's out there now is saying Christ is not necessary. He's not real. He's not needed. It's not necessary to be involved with him and to have him in your life. And you can sit in here and sit wherever and not really be affected by Christ. But I'm telling you with every fiber of being in me, you've got to learn to place Christ over the culture. Amen. The background on the text is very simple. Jesus went through the normal stages of growth and development. And Mary and his father, Joseph, went out every year. They went to the Passover. <clears throat> Somewhat like when you guys uh, go to the, the 4th of July festival, it happens every year, or the fair, and you get used to going to those things. Well, this was a Jewish ceremony. And here he is now 12 years old and under the custom of the law, when a young man turned 12, he was now considered a son of the law to the point that he was meant not only under his family, but now individually he was intended to be studying the law, but not only that, to follow the law to a T. 
it was that important. Further giving power to the fact that Jesus said later in the scriptures that I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the promises of the law. In that, that there is a better way to please God through Jesus Christ. I thought about that. It, it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So Jesus was obedient to the law. He did not come to tear down all the laws and the rules of which kind of people are trying to do now. But he said, I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to make it true. I've come to, to bring the promise to life. Amen. So God, this morning, young people, is growing you like, they did, like he did Jesus with purpose and with passion and with power. I know there's bumps along the, the road sometimes. I know there are times in your life that you just feel like, why even bother? Why even go to church? Why even fool with it? Why even get involved with all this stuff? But I want you to know, just stick with it. It will pay off. After a while, and by and by, and sometimes even sooner than you think. I know we have some witnesses in here that can tell you after years of walking with Christ. Can anybody say amen? It pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays every step of the way. It pays to serve Jesus. There were times I had opportunities to go off and do all sorts of things. But I remembered what was placed in Remember what those Sunday school teachers gave me in all their hours. I know there were times they prayed over their lesson and prayed for me. And it paid off. It paid off. So Jesus speaks in his words something that arrested my attention. He says here, why were you searching for me? He, he, in fact, <laughs> when Mary asked him a question, don't you know we've been anxiously searching for you? Amen. Kiera will point her out this morning. I'll hear it when I get home, but that's all right. <laughs> she got lost. Was it in Cincinnati, Louisville? And we went out of the store, and I know what she was doing. She was probably looking at some sunglasses, weren't you? I knew it. <clears throat> and we thought everybody was with us. And we went out of this mall, this busy mall, and went out, and, and when we got Part of the way down the, the, the thoroughfare of the mall, we looked around like, where is Kiera? Oh my goodness. And we went back to the store. Praise God, she had stayed right there. She had looked around. You know what? Understanding Jesus was a 12-year-old boy. And he somehow got separated from his parents. Amen? He, he however, was filled with wisdom. So here he is, if you look at this, as they, as, he, as they asked him this question, he was filled with wisdom. He, he answered their question with two questions. Now as parents, I don't know how you feel, but I don't particularly like that. Y'all might as well say amen. Grandparents, when you ask a question, am I preaching to anybody again? You want an answer. Don't answer a question with a question. My wife has said that to me. Because I have somewhat mastered the art of, of rerouting her. Her interrogation methods. She ain't in here, so. No. She ain't in here, so I can say it. Amen. To understand that, that he answered and he wasn't trying to be coy and he wasn't trying to be devious. He was stating a fact with a question. Don't you know we've been worried about you, Jesus? Don't you know we've been scared? We, and it's been three days. The Bible says after three days they found him. See, I know how I felt when she was just missing for three minutes. Three days. And they found him in church. Talking to the Sunday school teachers. Talking to the deacons. Talking to the preachers about the word of God. Lord have mercy. Can we put a pen down right there? If you were to get lost. If you were to be lost. Would your parents, grandparents find you at church? Talking to the teachers. 
talking to the Sunday school teachers, the preachers? Where would they find you? Where would you go? But I imagine that he had been there and there were responsible people that had taken care of him over that three days. The, the text doesn't say it, but it bears it out because he was still there. But notice he, he answers a question with two questions. Why are you searching for me? Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house about my father's business? Did you not know that? So from that statement, I, I saw three things, and we've tried my best not to, to preach these, and, and they've come out multiple times over the last several weeks. But I've noticed this. It, 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 there are three things. Write them down. Young people, write them down. Put them in the notes in your Bible. This spoke to me. You've heard it before, but it certainly is in the verse. It's in one particular verse. Verse 49. He said, did you not know? <clears throat> the, the King James said, I must be about <clears throat> my father's business. Amen. Amen. Te te technically, that's translated, I must be about my father's house. <clears throat> so, what we see here first is the fact that Jesus in this question exhibits and shows that he has realized and has an upward relationship. Say upward. upward. He has an upward relationship with his father. Joseph is there searching for him. Amen. His earthly father was looking for him, but his heavenly father knew exactly where he was. Amen. 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 And I want to let you know that even though you may feel that you have gotten lost, young people, in your journey, in your way, your heavenly father knows exactly where you are. And this point here shows that Jesus at age 12 had an upward and a knowledge that an upward relationship, meaning him and the Father, was of the utmost importance. Amen. You want a revolution? Somebody should have said, whoop, whoop. <clears throat> Do you want a revolution, Pay Creek? Amen. You get a group of people together who sell out and put God first yes. in their relationship. But if you really want to shake things up, and a lot of churches don't, mm -hmm. if you really want to shake things up, have it be some young people mm -hmm. that get on fire for the Lord and understand that he's first. Mm -hmm. Above any other physical relationship, boyfriends, yeah. Amen. Amen. girlfriends, Amen, somebody. God bless you, sir. Uh, my car. Lord have mercy on that one. Sports. God bless you. Amen. Uh, my job and making. Am I speaking to anybody in here? That, that, that upward relationship. It's easy to say it. It's easy to say God is first. It's easy to get up in a testimony. And folks can give some good ones. And I want to talk to God. He is at the top of my life. But you got to live that thing. This 12-year-old boy, Jesus. And I know he wasn't exactly ordinary. Amen. Fully God. Fully man at the same time. But notice this. He said, my father. I've got to be about my father's business. In Matthew 6 and 8, he says, the Heavenly Father knows what you have need of before we even ask. So as he is teaching the Lord's Prayer, notice this. He said, God, my Father already knows what you have need of before you even ask it. It's a personal relationship. It must be a one-on-one -on -one relationship. How many times did Jesus later on in his ministry go off to pray? He went off to talk to his father and meditate, and it was one-on-one. -on -one. So here is a, a great question, young people, I'm going to ask you. I've asked you every time I preach to you. Do you have a time during the day? Amen. Sister Cassie gave you a wonderful video lesson on this. Do you have a time during the day when you and God go one-on-one? -on -one? Because if you don't, 
you're shortchanging yourself. Yes, yes. If you make time for everything else yes. in your world, every time, time for your friends, time for sports, time for the TV, time, Lord, have mercy for yourself on 57 hours a week. Amen. I'm talking to you specifically. You need to have even the 11 year olds, even the 10 and the 9 year olds, you need to have a little bit of one on one time. Now, adults, I'm not going to leave you off the hook for nine times out of 10. They won't do that if they don't see you do that. If they don't see you bow on your knees and, and have the word of God in your hands and they don't see you sitting at the table and reading God's word and, and you don't talk to them about the word of God nine times out of ten, what you model, they'll do it. Uh -huh. okay. Amen. Young people in here, notice this. You've got to have a one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord. Amen. It's an upward relationship. To the point that Jesus said of his father, I don't seek to do my will. See, that's what happens when you have one-on-one -on -one time with him. You slowly give your will over to his. And Jesus says, I don't seek to do my own will, but I seek to do my father's will. And in whatever you do, you must acknowledge the father. Amen. The father is with you as a believer, and he is the only one in us as believers who can change the atmosphere of our schools. In order for our schools to change, it must change one student, one individual at a time that has gotten in the presence of a holy God and has one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus on a daily basis. Pastor, that seems simple. I want to do it, then do it. It's that important. Adults, it's that important. We are at a critical point of our world and our country and time for just dealing with God on a Sunday only is out. Uh -huh. Amen. You gotta be in his presence on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. And I know about that time that after the midweek fill up service, as I used to call it, midweek fill-up service, you start to get a little bit low. And how many of you remember the sermon we preached on a few months back, or about a year or more ago, in the evening, said you can't keep running on fumes. Uh -huh. You don't fill your car up with fumes and expect it to go. So you can't just put a little bit of word in you on Sunday and expect to make it all week long. You got to spend time in his presence. Yeah. Yeah. And it starts practice with your youth. Mm -hmm. Notice he said, upwards relationship. My father. There he stands in the midst of his earthly mother, and he stands in the midst of his earthly father, but he said, did you not know? I, I know why you were searching for me. I, I get it, but did you not know mm -hmm. that I had to be about my father's business? The second one is simply not only the upward relationship, but write it down, it is the inward relationship. For what God speaks to you, amen, from his word, you must internalize that thing. You must take it in, it must become a part of who you are. And if a school atmosphere is gonna change one more time, it has to change an individual at a time. The word individual starts with the letter I. And I thought about that. Michael Jordan and all the Bulls had this big last dance of video and shows that were out there in the spring. And he is famous for saying to one of his coaches when his coach was telling him, there is no Michael, there's no I in team. And he is famous for quipping back and saying, but there is an I in win. What he was saying in that particular moment is that, yes, I'm playing with four of the men on the court, but it takes me to make this thing happen. And that's what I want to let you know. It takes an individual at a time. You might be the only one in your classroom. You might be the only one in your family, young people. I don't know, but it takes an inward relationship, knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. Jesus understood as he was sitting with all these teachers of the law. Notice these were older men. These were men who were well learned. And the Bible says they were amazed and astonished at the questions he was answering and at the questions he was asking. 
Young people, there is a point in your life you have to realize that you don't have to take a back seat if you know who Jesus is. You can speak up. You can speak out. You can speak boldly for him. So many times people say, well, you just need to be quiet. How many of you have ever had the opportunity to present itself where you could say something for the Lord, but you didn't? Adults, on your job, amen. I'm coming to somebody's row. On your job, and you didn't say anything. You didn't speak up, you didn't speak out. Sitting there at the lunch table, and people are saying all sorts of things. That's a perfect time to say, you know what? I go to Paint Creek. I go to the youth uh, uh, meeting. I go to teen class, and this is what we learned. This is what they said to us. This is what I was thinking about. And you know what? You never know when that one word may arrest one person's attention and cause them to consider where they are and cause them to see your boldness and that you are not ashamed. Amen. I've gotten to the point in my life, I was not always there, but I'm realizing on my job, there's some people that are in my space that I am meant to speak to and somehow I've got to say something. Does it wake you up at night, adults? That person, amen? Does it wake you up at night sometime or do you get up thinking about it that there's this may be the day that I can share with them who Jesus is? Young people, you should be the same way. It is an individual relationship. It is an inward relationship that shines out. If Christ is in you, you can't hide him. Amen. 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 His light shines out. The Holy Spirit, praise God, is vital to the change and, and that is happening in you from day to day and to your growth. And I said it to the Bible class the other night. You cannot afford to be where you are right now, this time next year, if the Lord doesn't return. You should have grown. Amen. Had we planted that garden in the backyard and the plants were still this tall after three months, <laughs> something's wrong. But since you have people that are pouring into you, since you have a pastor that does his best to preach God's word to you, you have parents at home, there should be some growth that is happening. Amen. Amen. For in the Bible, the Bible is very clear. Hear me this morning. That young people that are serious for the Lord, it's not only what schools need, but it's what a church needs. It's what a community needs. Joshua was around 20 or so, and he took in 20-year-olds, um, um, that is, and he took them in to possess the land. There were those who were old that wouldn't change, wouldn't do right, wouldn't act right. They got left in the wilderness. David was a young person when he killed a giant. Josiah was just a boy king. And in the eighth year of his reign, he began to purge Israel. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to eat the king's meat at a young age. The young John the Baptist, amen, church, preaching and baptizing folks in the River Jordan. And Jesus, with a small congregation of 12 disciples, was just 30 years old. You don't have to be old to get in church. When I get old, when I get gray, I'll get in there and get busy. That's the problem. Some people wait too long. He wants you to give him your best in your youth. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Amen. Amen. God's calling for young people, individuals who can gain others. You can reach, you can reach some I can never reach at your lunch table. You can reach some. Jarrell and Donovan, that's under those blue helmets I can never reach. You can reach them on your, in your singing groups. Amen. You can reach them. So notice this. Let's, let's have some English. You might as well get ready for it because in a week it, it's coming. Let's have some English class for just a minute, shall we? He said, Jesus said, I must. <laughs> Amen. And, and must is a powerful word. See, the word must indicates that it is very important or it's very necessary or it is something that needs 
to happen. Lord, have mercy. When he said, I must needs go through Samaria, he was saying, there's no other alternative. I can't go around Samaria. I can't turn around and go back the way I came. I got to go through Samaria. Then he says uh, years earlier in this particular verse, he said, I must be about my father's business. So the word must is a modal verb. There are other modal verbs. Y'all know what a verb is? What's a verb? <laughs> it shows what? Action. And some verbs are, are passive and some are, are intransitive. And I didn't pay attention that much in that part of class. I didn't know how to outline sentences and I can tell you what a preposition is, amen. But I'm not much of an English major, but for those of you, you know a verb is the, is the, 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 the part of the sentence that gives you the action of it. And some of them you can't really measure action, but this is a modal verb. Some other modal verbs are shall, will, should, would, can, could, may, and might. And sometimes we use those modal verbs in excuses. Lord have mercy. Amen. Notice how the sentence would change if we used another modal verb. If he had a said instead, I must be about my father's business. If he had a said, I will be about my father's business. What that means is I will be. I'll do it later. I wish I had one witness. Later. So and so, come, can you come here for a minute? Give me a second. Hold on. Let me do this first. Jesus said, I must be. That means right now. I'm not going to wait till later. I've got to do it. Now, notice he did not say, uh, I would be about my father's business. But that would have been put the word as he just said, but. I would be. And you know, you got people that said, I would have done this. There's a lot of woulda, shoulda, couldas in the world. I would have been here. I would have been there. I could have been this if I would have. But. And how many you know but, since we're doing some English, negates everything you just said prior to it. Jesus didn't say, I would be about my father's business. He, he didn't, that, that, that denotes that there are priorities that are all, I've got something better to do than my father's business. No, he didn't say that. He said, I must be. And then he did not say, I might be about my father's business. That, that means folks might have to guess whether he was or was he not. And so that let me know as, as I looked at those different tenses of words that people don't need to guess, young people, amen, whether you're a Christian or not. They should know it amen. by how you carry yourself. They should know it by your snaps. They should know it by your Instagramming, by your chat, by whatever you are putting out there. It's not a guess. I think he's a Christian. I think she's a Christian. I don't know. Did you see this? Did you? No, they should know what you are. They should know you're a Christian. I might be about my father's business. I could be about my father's business. I will be about my father's business later when I get a moment, when I get a chance. No, he said, I must be. And there are some folks in here that need to understand that word. That must means it's necessity. It is an urgent thing. We live in an urgent time. And right now, this young man at 12 realized how important it was to start and to understand what his father's business was. He was at the age of accountability and his inward relationship what that was lined up with his upward relationship. He knew he had to be about his father's business. So what is his father's business? That would be the last one. It is the outward relationship. You see, Jesus never came to earth just to go to church. Jesus never came to earth just to hang out in his family and hang out on and, and, and grill steaks and, and hang out and talk to his friends and, and that's it. 
Jesus never came just to be a hermit out somewhere that people could talk about later, years later. Do you remember old so-and-so out on the backside of the desert? No, Jesus came, and from day one, people came to see him, and he went to see people. The shepherds showed up. The wise men showed up. Amen. Here comes Nicodemus, and here comes others. People came to him, so his ministry was one that was an outward ministry. His father's business. See, this is what happens in the house. You hear people say, what happens in-house? We handle it in-house. How many of you know it is not a must, it is not a, 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 a thing that we need to do here that whatever we learn here stays in-house. It's got to leave out of the house. You've got to give it, you've got to share it, you've got to tell somebody, amen, when a team or group is having a problem, they say we handle the matter in-house. And too many churches are still doing that. They come and they live, uh, sit and, and, and listen to the Sunday school lesson and it stays in-house. They come and they hear the sermon and it stays in-house. They come and they talk about Jesus and they learn a song and it stays in-house. Jesus said, go ye therefore. That means get out of the house. He said, I must be about my father's business. So what was his father's business? To reach a lost world. Amen. Psalms 139 says, young people, you are literally physically gifted to share God's word. Brother Pinnock, I heard him say it in the Sunday school class this morning. You have eyes, you have ears, you have a mouth, you have a nose, you have legs and arms and fingers. God has physically gifted you to share God's word, to hear it and then to share it. Amen. So whether you are an introvert or an extrovert, and we got all kinds. Amen. You won't talk about me, I'm a introverted extrovert. Amen. I'm an extroverted introvert. It just depends. Amen. But on the days that the Lord gives me something to say, I'll say it. And on other days that I don't have something to say, I will sit there and listen to his Holy Spirit and what's being taught so that when the time comes, I can share it. But here's the point. What I've realized, I cannot keep it in house. Amen. You're not meant to just cover it up and, and leave it there. You are meant to share. So when you hear about revelation and what's coming down the pipe, you need to share that to some young boy, some young girl that doesn't know. When you hear the words of the messages that are being shared by your youth leaders, by your pastor, you've got to tell somebody. All of you in here, you young people who are sitting there looking at me right now, you have been given character and charisma Amen. to share God's word. Uh-huh. Sitting there looking, acting like, uh-huh. He gave you character. He gave you personality. Jarrell, Jaquar, Donovan, all of you young ladies, he's given you tools that you could use for him, your voice, your mind, your wittiness. Jarrell's more witty than y'all might take him for. He's able to say things, just pull them out of air. You know what, Jarrell, you never know what the Lord can do with that. Donovan may be sitting there quiet, but don't, don't let that fool you. <laughs> Amen. These young men here, understand this young lady, get this, understand God has gifted you with things you don't even know about yet. Amen. When I was 12, 13 years old, Mr. Jim Hogan put a mic over in front of my mouth, and I did this. <laughs> well, I'm going to say, I'm not going to do that. I, I don't want to have that in front of me. I had thought about it, and I had grown up in church singing and wasn't ashamed of it, but I got to a point as a, as a preteen and a teenager, I didn't want to use my voice, but look at me now. Look what the Lord has done, and it's not because of me, but it's because of the relationship that he's placed inside of me. Don't shortchange yourself. I can't sing like this when I can't talk like this when I can't. No, he's giving you some great things. The Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Use those things. Learn right early what God has for you. Amen. 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 We won't get into it today, but understand if you're saved, somebody say, if you're saved. If you're saved. 
Somebody say, if you're saved, then God has gifted you. He has given you gifts by his Holy Spirit. And if you're saved, you got at least one. Amen. You may have more than one, but understand you are meant to use those gifts to edify, to build up the body of Christ. Amen. 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 What can I do with my gifts? I don't know. Be bold. Start a Bible study at school. Start a prayer group at school. Well, nobody will come. But you know what? If you've got to stand at the flagpole by yourself and pray. I wish I had two witnesses in here. I prayed. I prayed that the Lord would send some young people to our church and around our children that will be strong in here. Look what the Lord has brought. Amen. And he's bringing others. God can do anything but fail. If you got to stand by yourself at the flagpole, if you have to say and put up a sign and say, we're going to have prayer, maybe just one or two, don't be ashamed. God has gifted you to do great things in, in, in him. God has gifted you. The scriptures say, if you are ashamed of me before others, then Jesus said, I will be ashamed of you before my father. Young people may be saying to you, let's go over here and do this and do that, and you don't have a comeback. You need to be bold enough to say that I'm not into that. I don't believe in doing that. I don't choose to do that. Here's what I want to do. I must be about my father's business. Jesus and him speaking that, do you understand that he was giving them a future glimpse of what he would do? For at age 12, he understood already, I've got to be about my father's business. And then 18 years later, he started, amen, a group of young men. He went out and spoke to them and said, come follow me. Amen. 21 years later, we see Jesus about his father's business. And notice that when he spoke these words, he was headed to Jerusalem. But 21 years later, he would head to Jerusalem for the last time. And why was he there, Pastor Scott? He was there to handle his father's business. At age 33, Jesus handled his father's business. Well, what type of business did he handle, Pastor? Here's what he did. And I can only speak this because I have a proper inward relationship. Here's what he did when he went to Jerusalem and handled his father's business. He punched my ticket to heaven. How about yours? Amen. And since he handled his father's business, I've got to be. While he gives me life and breath and health in my body, since he handled his father's business, he has mandated each one of us who name the name of Jesus and are under the blood of the Lamb. Amen. He has mandated us to be about our father's business. You got to tell somebody you can't keep it to yourself. Why? Because this baby, he became a boy, and this boy became a man, and the Bible said he came from heaven to earth, and from earth to the cross, and from the cross to the grave, and from the grave to the sky. But let me say one more thing. He's coming back, back to the earth, to stand in the clouds, and to call those who have been handling his father's business in the storm, in the rain, when there was one or two, when there was nobody. He's coming back for a church without spot or blemish and I'm going, how about you? Hey, Amen. Jesus said, my meat, amen, is to do the will of him who sent me. My meat, what I choose to do is to do the will of him who sent me. I must be about my father's business. When he died, he handled his father's business. When he was buried, he handled his father's business. When he rose again, he handled his father's business. And as we've been studying that blood that was shed, amen, washed away and cleansed my sins and your sins. And because of his handling his father's business, we are declared not guilty in God's courts. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm not guilty. I am free. Mm -hmm. How about you? 
If you're going to change the atmosphere where you are, then you must realize that it takes a proper upward relationship. It takes a proper inward relationship, and it takes a proper outward relationship. You cannot affect and infect people, amen, in a positive way without the Holy Spirit in your life. Young people, as you go back to school, wherever it may be, it may be in your bedroom, I don't know. It may be actually in the schoolroom. That's where I'll be. I want to let you know, you have a tremendous opportunity to impact others with the gospel. Take what they have given you. Take what you have learned and share it with somebody. Don't leave it off to the side. Don't say, that's not me. I'm not one to talk. You can share it in your life. You can share it how you, how you choose to interact with others. But whatever you do, impact somebody's life this year with Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. As you bow your heads, we want to say a prayer. And we're going to offer an invitation, and then we're going to call them up to have prayer over them for the year and any other youth that want to come. Dear God, we 